Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm, wow, I didn't expect that. I'm going I'm to come out every Sunday morning just to get that. Then we we'll let Pastor Ryan preach. No, just kidding. Love you too. Thank you so very much. Wow. Wow, that's very touching. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you don't even know what I'm going to preach today. I'm going to yell at you all morning. You don't even know what's going to happen here. Our, our kind of closing out the theme that we've been sharing on being ready that Pastor Ryan led us in and, and Pastor Jody and all of us working together as a team. Uh, I've, I've entitled the message today, a very simple message. It's on your outline. We need to do more. We need to do more, not less. We need to do more. On my first Sunday here in Dover, October 14th, 1979, there were 60 people, and that included children, 60 people. And I knew then that if we, we would need to do more if we were going to grow. And that's why I was in the ministry. I was in the ministry to grow church, to grow church. And that meant bringing souls into the kingdom. And, of course, as we moved along, that we would grow as we came into the kingdom. Because growth begets growth. So you work in your life so that you can help someone else's life to know Christ. Well, it, it hasn't changed over those 40 years. It's still the same goal, still the same mission. You know, when we had our very first Thanksgiving feast here at Calvary, we, went, we invited the newspaper and we said, listen, come around 12 o'clock. We'd like to show you, to, we put it in the news as an exciting thing for the church and for the community, our first feast. Well, they show up at 11 o'clock when there's hardly anybody there. And in the newspaper article, they put out the next day, it said, Calvary Assembly has a less than effective feast. It was a, a, a port, and it, I thought, well, first of all, you came at the wrong time. Grant you, we only had 33 people. But they came at the wrong time, and there wasn't 33 people that day. But so you know what? We knew we had to do more. We didn't stop. We didn't let that discourage us. And today, we, last year, we, we fed 14,000 individuals. 600 and some families were served. We had uh, around 12 to 1,300 meals served on Thanksgiving Day. You know why? Because we knew we had to do more. I remember our very first, uh, what we would call Harvest Carnival, uh, on the night of Halloween, we'd had a harvest combine. A lady in the church wanted to do something with children. We had maybe 20 or 30. But you know what? We knew we had to do more. We did more. And last year, there were like 1,300 people in the parking lot on Halloween night celebrating a good cause with Christ on Halloween night. We remember in our first official Christmas thing that we did for the community, we had 77 the next year, we had 177. We just simply knew we had to do And when we did, today, we serve over thousands of people who come out to our productions because we knew we had to do more. And the reason we had to do more was because we were trusting God for change to come in people's lives. Our desire is that all may know by seizing every opportunity that comes our way through any venue to promote the cause and message of Jesus Christ with the view of enlarging his kingdom. Pastor Ryan sent us all a one-minute devotional at 938 this past week on Thursday. And it was the story in Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. It was the healing of a man with a deformed hand, but it was being done on the Sabbath. And, of course, they were giving Jesus a difficult time that this was happening on the Sabbath. It, it, it was a day that nothing's supposed to be done on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath, and that would be considered work that he was doing. But, but Jesus didn't stop ministry even on the Sabbath. 
And my response to Ryan was this. I sit back, I said, excellent. And I couldn't agree more. It is, it's a no-brainer that needs pop up every day of the week. Needs pop up in people's lives every day of the week. I cannot begin to tell you the many times I came to church on a Sunday afternoon and on a Saturday. Sometimes I was the only one here working on Saturday because it was still a work day for me. Saturday's a work day for me as, as the lead pastor over the years. But I can't begin to tell you how many times on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon I've come into the church just to tie up ends for Sunday night, and there's Margaret Young, still working in the benevolence department. You know why? Because people get hungry on Saturday, and people get hungry on Sunday. You see, we always have to look at how we can do more for the kingdom. If you know the first five letters of the alphabet, then you're going to understand the ABCs of Calvary. All you have to know is the first five letters. Please know more. But all you have to know is the first five letters of the alphabet, and you're going to know who we are. Because church has become all too often anything but what church used to be like. The, the seeker-sensitive church mentality has become so sensitive to the seeker that it's lost its sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. It's lost its sensitivity to how God's word is to be taught and, to, and how we're to learn it, to where it has become more man-driven than spirit-driven. And we never want a church to become man-driven. We want church to be spirit-driven. And 2 Timothy 4.3 substantiates this because it says, instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them. He's talking about the last days. Read it for yourself. 2 Timothy 4 that they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And we've become that kind of a church environment that today we seek out that teacher, that preacher, that person that will say what we want to hear so I can justify my behavior and how I live and feel good about my behavior and how I live. Well, Let's take a look at the ABCs of Calvary because it really sums up why we exist. Number one, first of all, is the letter A, adoration. And you're going to have a, 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 a key word here. It's going to be reach. Adoration is a reaching up. This is what we did today. We came in here and we reached up to the Lord by prayer, by praise, by worship. We reach in by the word of God. So as I stand here teaching, or as you go to a class, or you go to a small group, or you come to a Wednesday night class, or Sunday evening class, whatever, when any time that we gather, be it in the home, be it wherever we are, and where the Word of God is being studied, even in our personal devotions, what do we do? We're reaching into the Word. We're reaching. Notice the ideal of reaching. That's an active thing. All right? Then the letter C stands for community. This is what we do here when we get together in our small groups. We not just have small groups to teach us the word, but, but we have a chance to get to know each other. We reach around and, and we do a spiritual hug with one another in the body of Christ. You'll do spiritual hugging today. Did you know that? After the service and you mill around out in the foyer and grab a snack or talk with somebody, say hi to somebody, chat with somebody, you are reaching around to those people. It's called community. And then we have devotion, which is a reaching through. Now, this one here has to do with reaching through to God in prayer and in our own personal, in, in our own personal effort and energy and uh, desire to get to know God more. Because really, out of this personal pursuit of God, of reaching through to God in prayer, reaching through to God and reading the Word, studying the Word, as I grow in the Lord, that's what gives me what I have to give away to someone else. So there's the devotion. And then, last but not least, you all know this is going to be on the list, evangelizing. Reaching out through reaching the lost through any means possible. And this is really the simple plan of the ages. You can't get, if there are so many methods and so many ways to do all these five letters of the alphabet, but these are the five things we must concentrate on. These are the five things that we must submit ourselves to and must think about why we are here today, the reason for our existence. Because this, this, this little example really sums up who we are as a mission. 
But we need to have the right view of the church, service itself. What does it look like to come to a service? Well, I'm going to pull out notes I've taught for years on this particular area because I want to talk about the simple reason why we're here today as a community of believers. So when you come to church every time, you'll know why you're coming. You know, you will get, just remind yourself, why, honey, why are we here today? <laughs> I don't know, honey, why are we here today? Well, we're going to answer that question, why we are here today. And again, I want to stress, there are many methods, I know, but we can never change the message. So I want to talk about the simple reason we are here as a community of believers, all right? Let's, because we don't need to let church become complicated. It's not complicated. Number one, the condition. We're here to be conditioned through praise and worship. Again, when we were practicing praise and worship today, we were conditioning ourselves. I have another word we can insert here. We were communicating. We were communicating with God. Do we know who we're talking about here? We were communicating to the God of this universe in a personal way today. Again, we were communicating. We were being conditioned through praise and worship. For what purpose? Well, as we open up our heart and praise and worship to the Lord, it helps to prepare us for what's going to happen next in the service. We take very seriously what God wants to, us to hear when we come to church. And praise and worship prepares us for that. To bring us to a place of what I call, secondly, conviction which is the preaching and the teaching of the word. And you have in Ephesians where it talks about the purpose of God putting in the body of Christ, the pastor, teacher, evangelist, et cetera, et cetera. The word of God is a confrontive book. Did you know that? It's interesting. People will go to church today, according to the scripture, to hear what their itching ears want to hear. Well, I'll tell you what, that won't happen in this church. And in many churches, that won't happen. Because the word of God is confrontive. The Word of God is for the purpose and designed to speak to our hearts. It's designed to speak to our conscience. It's got some beautiful things in it, no doubt. It's got some uplifting, beautiful, encouraging things. But it's also got some very hard-hitting things because God knows our hearts. In fact, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it said it's to correct us, to train us, to rebuke us, to teach us. So we come to the house of God, and what are we going to get? Correction, training, rebuke. That doesn't sound like it's very much fun, but that's what the Bible's for. It's a confrontive book so that what happens is when he comes to convict us of our sins, when he comes to check our hearts and we check our hearts in before him, and he convicts us of our sins, he then can commend us to the Father through a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. The purpose of the confrontation is to change us so that we will conform, come to that growing relationship. So we go from being convicted of our sins to being commended to the Father. Which brings us to the third point of our service. As I'm standing here preaching today and teaching today, what can happen here is you can start to feel conversion. A conversion experience. Now by conversion, we mean a change. You're sitting here, you're listening to a pastor preach. It doesn't matter what pastor it is, but you're hearing a pastor preach, and he says something, and it stung a little bit. And the Lord speaks to you what the pastor said or what the Sunday school teacher said, and, and you felt confronted by the Word of God. No matter who was speaking it, you felt confronted by the Word of God. Well, that caused a little bit of a twinge in your spirit to bring about change. And there's two kinds of changes, two kinds of conversions that happen, two kinds of changes. Number one, it happens to the believer who comes to church Sunday after Sunday and has been confronted with the Word and realizes, you know what, Lord? You, you, this is good. I needed this today. Listen, after 40 years, you can't imagine how many people have come to me and said, Pastor, were you in my home this week? Did you have a videotape in my home this week? I said, no, but the Holy Spirit did. And the Holy Spirit took that video, and he spoke to our hearts as pastors, and when we prepared for a message, that's what we preached. We didn't know you were going through that, but the Holy Spirit did. He took a picture of it and sent it to us so we could preach on it. And so we, we, we change. That's how we grow. But then the second kind of conversion, the second kind of change, is when a person comes to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
I remember one time when I was sitting in my office talking to a couple, and I was questioning because I hadn't met them yet, got to know them, and, and they were coming for counseling, and, and I made the call, do you know the Lord? And the, and the lady said, yes, I, I prayed the prayer that you had on the screen. I said, well, well you should have told us. But she accepted the Lord that way, and then her husband, I was able to lead him to the Lord eventually in, in the sessions. But, but here's the point. That's conversion. The word spoke to her. The word speaks to us. And it causes us to have that sense of, that we need change. Then we have our commission. We come to church today. What am I supposed to do with what I hear today? Am I supposed to just collect it and put it on the archives of my mind of all the knowledge I have of the Bible? No. I'm to take that to the city. I'm to take that to others. I'm to go out and win souls, bring people to an experience to, to communicate Christ to them, realizing the challenge that, bef- that is before us. And I added one, simply the city, to say that uh, in Acts 1.8, it has to do with witness. In other words, listen, I'm adding this one to this because of this. We go out, it's good to live a good life before the people. Let your light so shine before men. It is good to live a good life, but ladies and gentlemen, we have to eventually get to the point where we are witnessing it. We're speaking it to people. We've got to tell people about Jesus in our cities. We've got to not just live a good life, which is a good example, which can bring people to Christ eventually through an example, but we've got to speak about Christ. We've got to tell them about Christ. We've got to show them how good God is. And that's why his power is given to us in Acts 1-8, that ye might be witnesses. Go out and be a witness. So, listen, when a life changes, there's a huge result that comes into play. When a life changes, uh, a turnaround happens. There's a turnaround. And this is huge. Because all of a sudden now, my lifestyle has been challenged. I've come to the Lord. I've accepted the Lord. And now I begin to feel like the Lord and know that the Lord, through the word that's being read, that I'm reading or that I'm hearing, I'm being taught, that things have to change in my life now. One of the things I don't believe pastors should do is what I call clothesline preaching. Where we tell you about everything on the outside, what we need to work on is on the inside so that God can change us from the inside out. My job isn't to tell you how to, what to wear, what to do, where to go, and all this. And that. My job is to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, what he did for you, what he wants to do in you, and let him change you and let him change me on the inside out. That's my job, to teach you about the word of God so you, the God's word changes us on the inside to produce something on the outside. But a turnaround happens. It stops a downward spiral It stops the downward spiral of a life who has influences that are all around them. Now, this is a very important thing I want to get across today. Again, it stops a downward spiral. When someone comes to Christ, it stops a downward spiral of a life who has influences that exist all around them. Now, watch this. For every good influence that someone can have on another person's life, A bad influence has a bad effect on someone else's life as well. So when you have someone that is a a good person in the Lord, they can have a tremendous influence on those around them, but a person who doesn't know the Lord can also have a huge impact influence on people's lives and continue to perpetuate evil, continue to perpetuate what is not good, what is not healthy. Because... We know that from the 12 spies. Ten came back with a negative story, and they all leaned that way versus the two who came back with a positive attitude. So many people will be affected in either one of these scenarios. And so that opens the door to a huge opportunity we're going to get into because a new chain reaction occurs. When, When one comes to Christ, a new chain reaction occurs, not just for the person who has changed, now listen carefully, but those around them as well. This is how important your testimony is. This is is how important your change in your life is. It was never intended that you house and, and hoard your change. It was to help you 
but at the same time to help you to help someone else who needs a change in their life around you. So a, a new chain reaction occurs, and we're going to prove that in a moment. And see, when that happens, Satan loses ground. Understand this connection. Satan loses ground because when the chain reaction is complete, the loss of the bad influence is even greater now in that person's life and the people around them. So if, if, when a person's life changes, first of all, Satan lost ground on that person. But now, because of the change in their life, and they walk out of that experience, and they begin to let their light shine, and begin to witness to others, Satan is going to be able to lose now. He's going to lose more ground in those people's lives because a different influence and a different attitude and a different lifestyle and a different perspective is now coming to them from a God perspective. And that's going to help change that person now, imagine the chain reaction, and I'll show you what that will look like in just a moment, just with a family. Sorry? So let's see how this happens. Well, there are, I, I told the, the team recently in a meeting, and uh, I mentioned this on Sunday night. I mentioned it on Sunday night class. Uh, there are two directions in life for the church. There's coming and there's going. That's the only two directions there is for the believer. There's a lot in those coming and goings. Don't get me wrong. But that's the two directions of life when it comes to a believer in Christ. Is that you come, but then you go. So let's, let's read about this. In John chapter 4, and when Jesus was talking to the woman in Samaria, when he went through Samaria, and he was talking down, he sat down by a well. It was about noontime. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, will you, will you give me a drink? Will you give me a drink? This is John 4, 7. Because the disciples had gone into town to buy food. So Jesus is thirsty. Of course, he knows what he's doing with this lady. He's, no, he's thirsty, I don't doubt. He's hungry. They went to buy food. He's sitting down, so he's resting. He's probably tired from the journey. And the woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because they don't have dealings with each other. They don't associate. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you this for a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? And Jesus, he went on to answer, he said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of wild water welling up into eternal life. And so he's baiting her with a different kind of drink <laughs> to do a, a quenching of a different kind of thirst that she's not understanding, but it's luring her in. It's pulling her in. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So she, she's thinking there's some H2O out there that's going to change everything. But, of course, we know what Jesus was referring to. And then look at verses 28 and 30. It says, through 30, it says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? But notice the word. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. They came. There's two directions we take. There's a coming. That's the first one. In verse 39 through 41, it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Notice the word, many. Believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came, say came, came, come to him. They urged him to stay with him, and, and he stayed two days because he had many more, and, and it says, and because of his words, many, say many, more became believers. Come. That's the first direction we take. Jesus said, come to me, and I'll give you rest. Jesus said, Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Jesus said, abide in me, and I will abide in you. Notice the coming. For us as believers, the first direction in life is a coming to Christ. 
In fact, by the way, for the unbeliever, the first direction in life for them technically is come to Christ. Jesus said, will you give me a drink? And, and everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst again. Sir, give me this water. That day, her life changed to the fullest. Wow. The difference, the change that one drink made in her life, a spiritual drink, she met Jesus. And here's what was so beautiful. After she met Jesus, look what she did. She did the second direction of life. What well, is the second one? Go. Go. She went back into town, told some people what happened. Many believed. The whole bunch came out, and the Bible says, and many more believed again on listening to him. The woman went back into the town, going. So when the Samaritans came to him, coming. They could now go back to their place, and they could begin the influencing of those they knew, causing Satan to lose even more ground in more people's lives because the influence of Christ through somebody begins to change directions for those people and that begins to spread. So here's what it looks like. I put a little, uh, little chart together here for you. I think it'll pop up, right? One plus, nope, wrong one. There you go. One plus one equals two. Plus one equals a few. Plus more equals many. And on it goes. One drink one conversation, one time spent with the Lord Jesus, and a life was changed that went back into town, brought people to Jesus. She became the first female evangelist that I know about in the New Testament, became a female evangelist, went into town, got people saved, people, more people came out, and more people got saved, all because of one drink of living water with the encounter with Christ. And as a result of that, oh my, a change happened in that entire community of people. Think what Jesus can do through your testimony because how do we do this? We have to do more than what we're doing. The reason we've grown over the years is because we kept doing more. We kept doing more, we kept doing more. Let me show you this next diagram. This diagram I put together was uh, the, my mom and dad is the top letters, MD, mom and dad. Above them is a zero, a circle. You know what that means? There was no spiritual influence in my mom's life growing up. There was no spiritual influence in my dad's life growing up. In fact, uh, my dad said, son, every single one of my family members, brothers, sisters, mom, dads, etc., all had alcohol content at their death inside of them. None of them knew the Lord. My mom, none of them knew the Lord. Now, eventually, my grandmother uh, did come to the Lord near the end of her life. I will say that. But over the years, my mother had no spiritual influence. Her dad was stabbed to death in a bar. She just had a rough upbringing. And my dad, of course, he ran the streets of Detroit. it has been 18 years in prison. There was just nothing there in his life. But when me, my son, when I came to know the Lord... Uh, through my mom and dad taking me to church, having family devotions. I was raised in the nursery. I was raised in junior church and Sunday school. My mother taught me in Sunday school when I was growing up. She taught Sunday school for 25 years in our church in Michigan. By the way, my home church in Michigan now runs 7,000. It's, 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 a, it's a growing church. They were a very strong teaching church. Now, I had three children, Aaron, Ryan, and Renee, and they each have kids. Now, uh, uh, all the three kids, Chloe, Taylor, Tyler, Myel, Ryland, which, by the way, my daughter and Ryland are in town today. Praise the Lord. They got him safely yesterday. And then we have Ryan with Connor and Ava, and they are now serving the Lord. And I just drew one example, one arrow to the left of my of, of son, that was, the F stands for friend. I know this friend who has three children. They're now serving the Lord. So there's fifth, was that 15 people 15 people, and that's just a simple graph of how quickly good influence begins to spread. 
Now, you see, what happens is all of us touch base with those around us. So my children and even the grandchildren, they have their friends that they can touch base with and have a good fluence. Can you imagine a change that can happen in a community? Because it did happen in Jesus' day when this woman went back into town and all these people were getting saved. And imagine what Jesus is going to do if we'll just do a little bit more, if we'll do more, if we'll do more, if we'll do more and not do less, if we'll keep going forward, keep taking the message forward. Can you imagine what Jesus is going to be doing in the near future? So what is church? What is church? How, who are we? We are a community of believers having the same experience in Christ through salvation, meaning that there's only one way to get saved, and that's through Jesus. There's no other ways. When my wife worked for Olivet College at, on the campus of Olivet College in Michigan, she opened up their book, their, their, their manual for a new student coming into town, and it was a congregational college, considered a, a Christian college, and I say quote-unquote on that, uh, because when we were there, we, didn't, we saw anything but Christian. But anyways, that's what they stand for. Uh, congregational people are good people, but this particular campus wasn't practicing Christian principles. And when my wife opened up their manual, it said, just as there are many ways to get to a rooftop of a house, there are many ways to get to heaven. And, of course, my wife had to disagree with that, but she still worked there. And we, I had an office there to counsel college students, so we had a chance to influence for the kingdom. But a community of believers having the same experience in Christ through salvation and a commitment to each other to foster that experience through growth, through discipleship, introducing, discipling others to Christ along the way. we got to do more of this. Our existence is really quite easy. You ready? We come to Jesus, we get more of Jesus, and then we go and we give Jesus away. That's why we went from 60 to over 1,500 to over 2,000 on our data system that make Calvary their church. We did that through people influencing others into the kingdom through the various ministries and methods that we've used over the years. Listen. What if Jesus that day had said to himself, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I'm taking a break. But he chose to speak out to this lady amidst all the natural reasons why he didn't have to, but he chose to. Not only did her but many people, the Bible said, came to Christ because he went against the natural things and chose to do the spiritual thing. I don't care what day of the week is, folks. In the future, let's work together. Just because I might be stepping aside as the lead pastor, don't you step aside saying, well, I've done my part then. No, you haven't. And no, I haven't. I plan on sitting right there with you. And I sit, plan on sitting right there beside you, working with you to go forward in this church, to go forward in this community. Why? Because there are so many people that yet are unreached. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's, let's pray. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for today. And thank you, Jesus, that... For that wonderful reception coming in, Lord, what a humbling, um, uh, tear-jerking experience that was, Father. I, I felt the love, and I appreciate that. Lord, all these years, Lord, for all these years, Lord, all these years, you've been faithful. You've been faithful. You've been faithful. We've lived by a very simple principle in this church over the years, and the principle is this. We need to do more. We need to do more. We need to do more. Because there's just too many people on the way to hell. And we want to stop that. And we want their influence to be out there to turn people's lives around for the glory and kingdom of God. So, Lord, use us today when we leave to do more, to say more, to give more, to do what we can more, more, more 
so that we can have a positive influence in this community and that we can see many, many, many more come into the kingdom of God, just like it happened in this community in Samaria that day. And we thank you. And I pray, Lord, today, anybody in this room doesn't know you, that they'll reach out to you and say, Jesus, here I am. I need you. Forgive me my sins. And I accept you. I want you in my life. Jesus, you'll come in. You'll change them. So now use this, we pray, in a mighty way. And all God's people prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.